Hey everyone, it's Friday. Time for the weekend. This is our Bible study number 18 already. We're going to begin Mark chapter 6 tonight. I thought that was pretty cool. We're moving pretty quickly. Hope everybody's enjoying us. I want to thank everybody for uh, liking, subscribing, commenting. I, I do want comments. I mean, positive comments. If you have any questions, certainly I want those because I want to work with people. I'll be happy to answer any questions about scripture. Um, question about salvation and a prayer list. I've got a long prayer list. I should show you one day, but anyway, I have a long prayer list from people that do uh, write in. They either comment on Facebook or they comment on YouTube. Some people have uh, that I know got my text. They text me stuff, but yeah, we're doing pretty good. We are. Um, this is our study number eighteen, Mark chapter six. I like this one. Not real deep. We're gonna go short. Just six verses. Mark chapter six, one through six. Uh, and, um, yeah, so let's begin. So in Mark chapter six, verse one, it says, Jesus left there and went to his home. So we know he went from Capernaum to Gennesaret, back to Capernaum. And now he's going to his home. His home is Nazareth. We know that's where Jesus was raised and that's where his small town was. That's where he would live as a, as a small boy. What do we know about his life as a small boy? Not much. Um, because, uh, he, we would say that he grew up like any other child. A typical Jewish upbringing in a in a in a poor, relatively poor family, and um, he was a carpenter. His pair, his family trade was carpentry. Like that, pretty neat. Again, that goes along with the theme that I always say that Jesus was not a wimp. I don't know many wimps who are carpenters. That's hard work. That's that's uh, that's that's some manual labor, and it's a skill. It's a dying skill today. We need some good carpenters today. So. And in Mark chapter 6, verse 1, Jesus left there, which would be Capernaum, and went to his home, which was Nazareth. He's accompanied again by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. I like this. If you look at the first two verses, uh, we know that Jesus is a carpenter. What did he do the other six days? He worked. He was a carpenter. He may have teached and preached, went around preaching, doing miracles and those things, but he was also working. He was a carpenter. And he waited till the Sabbath. He did everything in order. And as a, as a believer and as people who I often talk to, and, and I'm just like everybody else, obviously, um, when people say, what do I do at work? I want to I wanna witness at work. Well, there's a time and a place for that, that when you have a little time, maybe a water cooler moment, or you know, you get a lunchtime. When you're, if you are a carpenter, you get to sit there and talk to your friends and tell people about Jesus. But for the five or six days that you work, most of us work six days. I was one of those people who worked six days. Uh, literally, the, your work ethic is your greatest testimony. Your character is your greatest testimony. So go to work. Be there on time. Do what you're told to do. Do it with excellence. Help others around you. Be an example of what a good employee would be. And at home, have character. Be the man or woman you should be for your family, providing, supporting men, loving, protecting, providing and respecting your wife and women, respecting your husband, supporting your husband. And then be a parent. With all these things going on in the world today, I see the shootings in schools, another one in Georgia. The, the problem are not the guns. The problem are the upbringing. Where are the people who are supposed to be raising children? Parents need to parent. Help your teacher out. They want to do their job. That doesn't mean all teachers are perfect. Doesn't mean all kids are perfect. Doesn't mean all parents are perfect. I'm just saying we need to parent. We need to hold our children accountable. We need to love them. We need to rear them as we should. And, and one of the most foundational things to rearing a, a contributing family to society is to go to church on Sunday morning. And so you work six days a week. You work five days a week. But on Sunday is your opportunity, other than work ethic, is your opportunity to be that teacher that example in church, that preacher, that minister, whether you're the pastor or not, Peter says we are all believer priests in Christ. We all have something to do on Sunday morning. If you just want to sit in the crowd and do nothing, that's up to you. But if you want to minister, you say, Rob, how, how can I help? How can I do something? Do it on Sunday morning. Your pastor needs help. Your church needs help. It is very common that 15% of anybody in the church, for example, you have a church of a thousand, 15% of those people are carrying the load for the rest of the 85%. Get involved in your church, be a teacher, get involved in a ministry, be a door opener, be a greeter, take the offering, pray for your preacher. 
preachers are human too and we need help pray for his family because believe me my family paid when i was in ministry the last the last 12 years it was very brutal on my family so anyway there's your ministry work five days work six days be an excellent be a model employee and on sunday give back to your church whether it's tithing praying or volunteering whatever you can do and this is what jesus did he worked he traveled he preached he taught and then he went to the synagogue as he should it would have been on saturday uh, as a Jew, he would be to the synagogue teaching. And many heard him preaching. And they were amazed. He spoke as one who had what? Authority. We need that in the church today. There are so many teachers and preachers that have very little authority when it comes to preaching and standing upon the Word of God with conviction and the infallible Word of God. This is God's Word. It is nothing less. And we need to treat it as authority uh, and guidance and everything that we need for uh, a Christian walk. So anyway, stand strong in the word, teach with authority. And they were amazed at him and how they did this. And so they asked this question, where did this man get these things? Oh, wait, we saw this guy. This is a little dude down the road that, as we know in the Bible, got lost in Jerusalem for five days. And now he's preaching like he's some kind of authority figure. They refuse to recognize him. And when you're famous and, and when you become a person I mean, I remember being a state trooper and going home and people were like, oh, that's a little Bobby Rhodes from down the road. He was he was a troublemaker. I really wasn't, but I, I was a little ornery now and then. But it's really hard for people to recognize your position because they're so familiar with you and people were familiar with Jesus Christ. So it's hard for them to look at him and say, oh, man, that's our Messiah. Because, yeah, he was a little dude, a little runt down the street that um, was a typical boy. So uh, and, and then to get lost in Jerusalem for five days, a little scary. But anyway. So what is this wisdom that has been given to him? He even does miracles. This is going to be hard to accept when you're very familiar with somebody, when your best friend or your child comes in and says, by the way, I have a gift. I'm a doctor. Yeah, you're a doctor. You're the kid that broke my windows with a rock during Halloween one year. But it's really hard. But when this, what is this wisdom? So they're questioning his message. They're questioning his authority. And that he even does miracles. Isn't, verse 3, Mark chapter 6, isn't this the carpenter? He's a carpenter. I saw him working down the road. He put a roof on, man, and half of it blew off in the big storm. I don't know how good of a carpenter Jesus was, but certainly everybody knew he was a carpenter. He was a, he was a, um, he was a contractor. He fixed your roof. He fixed your mortar. He laid down sidewalks and all that hard work that carpenters do. It's a respectable profession. And it's a skillful profession. It's I can't make an ashtray. So I look at people that can build homes and go, wow, you got a pretty cool skill, man. My friend Ronnie Kirkwood, my friend Rob Riley, Riley Construction. Man, these guys are good. And I'm like, I don't know how you guys do it. It's a gift. They have a gift. And so Jesus has this gift. He's a carpenter. They're not looking at him as a teacher. They're familiar with him. And they more, they more commonly recognize him as a carpenter. Not only is he a carpenter, but this was Mary's son. Mary's nobody. Mary's nobody special. Who does he think he is? He didn't go to college. Isn't that something? I think college is overrated to a certain extent, unless you're a doctor or so something going into something specific. College can be overrated as well, but he's a, cook, a man with a profession, blue collar man. So how is he taking authority over me? Who does he think he is? This is Mary's son. He's a carpenter. How much do we know him? Well, he's got brothers. And here goes the myth that he had no brothers or sisters, that after Mary had Jesus. That was it. This is not true. Here in this scripture, in Mark chapter 3, it clearly points out that Jesus had brothers and sisters. His, isn't this Mary's son? The brother of James, the brother of Joseph, Judas, and Simon. So there's at least four brothers. Aren't his sisters here with us? And then they start to get offended at him. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are teaching us? You grew up under us. We taught you. You were that little kid down the road. Now you're going to teach us in the synagogue? They didn't recognize him as Christ. And because of this, they, it shows they had little faith. They had no belief in who Jesus was. And Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house, is a prophet without honor. Um, yeah, I was offered a pastor at one time in, in near my hometown, and I didn't take it because I know people know me. I was just the typical everyday young guy was a little crazy. I did everything young guys did. And I'm like, I don't think that would be good for ministry. Although I, I liked everybody. I was well liked and, and I was res had respect. But, but you know, everybody's familiar with you. It's hard to, to do marriage counseling with somebody when uh, you're that little guy that grew up down the road and sold apples 
on 46 in front of Young's country store. So it's just one of those things. He could not do any miracles there except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at what? Their lack of faith. So anyway, this is the problem with familiarity. Don't be familiar. Don't be too familiar. If you're too familiar with a pastor or somebody in your church, maybe you guys should do go to separate churches or something. I don't know what the answer is, but being familiar is, can be a hindrance to ministry. Secondly, I wanted to say this. Jesus went to the synagogues and he taught. And a lot of us sit back, and I've just, I was just at a thing with 30, 40 pastors at a meeting. And a lot of guys said, well, people weren't coming to our church. People weren't coming to our church. And I asked one guy, what do you do to get people in? He says, well, we put everything online. They should be coming in by the hundreds and thousands. And I'm like, well, some people don't go online. Some people don't go online to read your ministry. And that ain't biblical at all. Now, listen, that's an effort. That's a way. That's a method of getting people to church and making people aware of your services. What does the Bible say? Go into the world. Church and the building is a nice place to meet. Not everybody's going to go there. Not every, some people find it very intimidating to go to church. Go to them. When I was at Sugar Tree Ridge, I had a, a Bible study on Monday morning at one of the local restaurants, the Old Y restaurant. On Tuesday morning, I had coffee with people in the public, and we would sit there and have a little Bible study at Whole Fields Coffee in Whole Fields, Whole Fields Station. And then on Wednesday, we would kind of take a break, but I think it was Thursday or Wednesday. I'm sorry, I forget. But we would have dinner and a Bible study for the church and for anybody who wanted to join at the 24 Exchange Restaurant in the center of Hillsboro, Ohio. So we had three places we met out of the church in order to minister to people that might not come to church. If you're sitting in the church waiting for people to come, they're pro they may not come. The Bible says five times. And I'm going to give you these scriptures. I looked at the Great Commission scriptures. Matthew 20. 18 to 20, excuse me, Matthew 28, 18 to 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Luke 24, 47, John 20, 21, and Acts 1, 8. Basically, go out into the world. Now, coming back to the churches where you meet after you've gone out, churches should be sending people from the church into the streets at least three to four days a week at least three, and have a midweek service, maybe have a Bible study, have a Bible study. The midweek service is tough. It's tough on the preacher nowadays, everybody's obligations. Have a Bible study on Wednesday night. Have something prepared where everybody has a little bit of homework and go home and study the Word. That's making disciples. My main goal when I was pastor, where I was at in the last four churches, was to raise leaders, not followers. I didn't want followers of Rob. I wanted followers of Jesus Christ. And I want to know that when I left the building, that the people that were technically, quote unquote, and the, the flock or under me as a leader were being raised up to be leaders. And that means men and women. That means I had we had women lead in the children's ministry. We had men reaching out to men's ministry. We had men in the church that never did any preaching preach when I wasn't there. We're raising leaders, not followers. So I was watching, just Jesus is doing the same thing, by the way. He's going out, he's going out, he's going out. If your church ain't grown, it's because you're not going out or you have nothing to offer when people get there. One of those two things. The second one is we're raising leaders, not followers. Jesus didn't say, okay, everybody just follow me, stay behind me. You know, take up your cross and follow me. Yeah, that means you got some skin in the game. He's raising leaders. And then later on, he sends people out two by two to preach the gospel. Why? He's training them, them to be leaders. And so uh, that's what I have for today. Jesus well, was a carpenter. He got little respect in his hometown. Familiarity can be a problem in the church. Um, and then basically, if you want to be an evangelist, if you want to have a part in any type of ministry, be a model employee at your employer's place of employment or whatever, at your office, at your factory, at the store you work at, be a model employee. And on Sunday morning, when church is being held, offer your services, offer your talents to the church and inspire some kids, inspire the next generation, older couples. And, and people, one guy told me there was a pastor, his name's Greg, one time told me people over 65 are culturally insignificant in the church. They're insignificant. I said, you're, you're wrong. People over 65 have made it. They've made it 65 years. Some have been married 50 years. 
Don't you think they have something to offer the church? Don't you think they have something to offer young couples that might be going through hard times and say, this is what got us through? If you're over 65, you're not done yet. Until you start pushing up daisies, you have value. You have a purpose. I don't care if you're 85. You can still inspire young people to serve God. So hang in there, and I hope everybody has a great weekend. We'll see you Monday morning.